stoichiometry. Okay, so module seven, we learned this idea of counting atoms and molecules using the mole concept. What is the mole? Just generally speaking, not the number, like but what is it? How many of, like, molecules. Yeah. It's a unit of counting, usually applied to moles of atoms or moles of molecules. Like I said, in jest, it could be a mole of zebras. Can you imagine the feed bill and the cleanup for a mole of zebras? 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of them. It's huge. Much bigger than Noah's Ark. Much bigger than our planet. Okay, that's a huge, huge number. But we approach that idea of counting atoms and molecules because we know it's impossible for us to go through and count them one at a time. One, two, three, four. They count up enough of them that we can actually measure them with devices that we have to take their mass, for example. It's way too small. So what we have to do is take a large number of them, find the mass of them, and then divide by the number of them to figure out the mass of one of them. That's the idea of using, of counting atoms and molecules using a mole. We also talked about how to calculate the products of a reaction relative to the reactants used. We did that with this question. This was the last practice problem of module seven. It said in the decomposition of 1.2 moles of dinitrogen pentaoxide, how many moles of oxygen would be formed? Practice problem 710. And so in that process, we went through and said, well, first thing I'm going to do is take and write down the formula for the molecule. And then on the other side of the reaction arrow, since it's a decomposition reaction, I'm going to write down each of the elements that's involved in the molecule. I mean, what is the molecule made of? Of nitrogen and oxygen. That was the first step. What's the second step? Mark those homonuclear diatomics with a subscript of two on the product side of the decomposition. <coughs> Step three. Balance, it. Balance the equation. Good. <clears throat> now you're just showing off. High score on the test. There we go. I'm kidding. So you go through and balance that. You've got the, the raw equation, the annotation of the homonuclear diatomics, and then balancing the equation. So in this equation here, that two dinitrogen pentaoxides decompose into two nitrogen molecules and five oxygen molecules. See if there are 10 oxygens on the right, 10 oxygens on the left, four nitrogens on the right, four nitrogens on the left. It's a balanced reaction equation. Stoichiometry requires that you have a balanced reaction equation before things work. You have to have a balanced reaction equation. So anytime there's a reaction that you're going to assess, they're going to analyze using stoichiometry, it has to be balanced. So it's incumbent upon you to check it to make sure it's balanced. When it is balanced, then we can come back to here to that balanced reaction equation and make the statement, for example, that two moles of nitrogen pentaoxide decomposes into two moles of nitrogen gas and five moles of oxygen. Do you see that? With the stoichi These numbers in the front, we've been calling them just the coefficients. Those are the stoichiometric coefficients. They tell us the proportional relationships between every reactant and every product in that balanced equation. So if I told you that two moles of nitrogen, dinitrogen pentaoxide decomposes to produce two moles of nitrogen gas and how many moles of oxygen gas, you would get to that point and say, oh, two produces two and five. Two molecules decomposes to produce two molecules and five molecules. Two moles decomposes to produce two moles and five moles. Right? Two dozen decomposes to produce two dozen and five dozen because they're going to be pro pro proportional all the time. For the balanced reaction equation, it's true. Unbalanced reaction equation is not true. It has to be balanced. So we started with these from the last module. And that's where we said, OK, if I didn't have two moles, if I had 1.5, excuse me, 1.2 moles rather than two moles, right? If I had 1.2 moles of dinitrogen pentaoxide, then how many moles of oxygen would I produce? I produce three. How do you know? Well, I have 1.2. And according to the equation, 
right? According to the equation, five moles of O2 is produced for every two moles of nitrogen, dinitrogen pentaoxide that's decomposed. Where do I get that five to two? I get it from this equation right here. And it'll make more sense with the rest of the slides that we have here today. But we've already done that. We're basically going to take that same concept and now work it in a much fuller manner. So in this module, we're going to expand that idea of how to relate any product and any reactant to any other product and any other reactant, not just in the simple way we've been doing it so far. And then also we're going to talk about masses. Now what we've said before is that 2 produces 2 to 5. That works in terms of moles, the count. That does not work with regard to mass. That only works in the count, the pieces, using the stoichiometric coefficients. But there's a way, we already know how to do it, but it'll make more sense later, how to move from moles to mass and mass to moles. So if we can have a mass converted to moles and then relate the moles and then turn it back into mass as a multi-step process, we'll be able to move not only from moles to moles, but from masses to masses. That's more towards the end of this module. So we're kicking off with chemical equations and the statement about chemical equations. The chemical equations are much like mathematical equations. If you think of it truly as an equation, you might have something that, you know what, we can modify it. And I've used this before. As long as we do something legitimate to both sides of the equation, it's true. If you have a mathematical equation with an equal sign in the middle, right, a statement of some sort of equality, and if you take everything on the left-hand side and you multiply it by 3, what do you have to do to make it still remain to be true? If everything on one side of the equal side is multiplied by 3, don't you have to multiply everything on the other side by 3? As long as you multiply everything by 3, it's still true. So there, there are some things that you can do for math that as long as you do a legitimate step, you, the statement is still true. If you decide you're going to add 5 to one side of an equality and not add to anything the other side, is it still true? No. But if I add 5 to both sides, guess what? It's still true. Let me use some examples for that. So an equality or equation relates the left-hand side to the right-hand side. If we have this example here, y plus 3 equals x, the left-hand side is being related to the right-hand side. Right? You see that? Whatever y plus 3 is, it equals x. So x is equal to y plus 3, and y is equal to x minus 3. Those are both true. This one... I get straight from this equation here. I just write it in the opposite order. See, I wrote x is y plus 3. That's this associative, right? I've, I've changed it around. Actually, that's commutative. Coming back around. y plus 3 equals x, and x equals y plus 3. This one here, y equals x minus 3, how did I get that? Subtract 3 from both sides. I use a legitimate mathematical process to convert it into whatever I'm looking for. If I said, what is y equal to, you come back and say, y is x minus 3. So if you give me more detail and say, OK, x is 7, what is y? OK? If x is 7, what is y? I would go to the equation that says y is equal to x minus 3. If x is 7, y is 7 minus 3 or 4. Right. And then I said, if y is equal to 2, what is x? Well, I go to x. I'm solving for x. x is y, and y is 2, so it'd be 2 plus 3. y is equal to 5. So given information about one side, you can determine the information for the other side. That's exactly what we're doing in stoichiometry and chemistry. We're taking a reaction equation. We're balancing it to make it true. And then once we have a true statement, we treat it like math, and we can change things around and look at different things to solve for, given certain things, solve for other unknown things. Why? Because the stoichiometric coefficients are going to give us how they're related to one another. So chemical equations work in the same way. Now, in your book, I've walked through example 8.1 on my slides. Here's the question. It says, a chemist forms ammonium sulfate. That's an excellent fertilizer. It also is an explosive. By combining ammonia and sulfuric acid, if she ends up making 12.2 moles of ammonium sulfate, how many moles of ammonia 
were used. It's given a certain amount of one of the pro of the product. Now it's asking us for how much of one of the reactants was used to make that much product. So walking through that, the reaction equation. First, we're going to write down the basic reaction equation. It's a formation. You see that? That we're forming something. It's not a formation in the sense like we did last module, where I have elements that form a molecule. Here I've got two molecules that form a greater molecule. It's still a formation reaction. But we're going to react ammonia and sulfuric acid to produce ammonium sulfate. Now, just looking at that real quickly, you have to ask the question, is it balanced? Uh, no. no, it's not balanced. Right. So we're going to balance it. And when we do the balance, we do the matrix, we say, well, OK, I need the same number of nitrogens, hydrogens, sulfurs, and oxygen on both sides. The balanced reaction equation comes to, and again, this was the last couple modules, so hopefully you can take this and balance it to get this. You need to be able to have that skill. If you don't, you need to review that skill. OK? So you end up with a balanced reaction equation that two moles of ammonia and one mole of sulfuric acid reacts to produce one mole of ammonium sulfate. That's our balanced reaction equation. Now, we're going to say that there's a relationship here of ammonia to ammonium sulfate. There's a relationship between them. What's the basis of that relationship? This balanced reaction equation. I'm looking for a relationship between ammonia here and ammonium sulfite, oh, sulfate excuse me, here. Now, the relationship is based upon their stoichiometric coefficients. What, are the stoichiometric, what is the stoichiometric coefficient that's in front of ammonia? It's a 2. It's a 2. Do you see that? The stoichiometric coefficient in the balanced reaction equation in front of ammonia is a 2. What is the stoichiometric coefficient in front of the ammonium sulfate? What is the stoichiometric coefficient right here? It's an implied 1. Okay? It's an implied 1. That any time we have a molecule or an atom, and there's no coefficient in front of it, it has to be an implied one. It's not zero. But frankly, if you want to start including everything that has a stoichiometric coefficient of zero, then every known element and molecule needs to be in this equation. Because we have none of everything else that exists. And we don't do that. We make it easier for you. And there has to be at least one of them to include it. We're not including everything that isn't part of the reaction. That'd be overwhelming. It's implied that everything that's not there has a zero in front of it. And it's implied that everything that is there has at least a one in front of it, unless it's modified by a two, three, four, five, and so on. All right? So the stoichiometric coefficient of ammonia is two, and the stoichiometric coefficient of ammonium sulfate is a one. In some way, they're related to two to one. That's their proportionality. So two moles of ammonia. Now, I get bound up with this equal sign. Is it truly, literally equal to? Equal to me tends to be the same thing. Is two moles of ammonia the same thing as one mole of ammonium sulfate? No. They're different molecules. So remember when we say they're equal to, we're talking about their relationship proportionally. That's why at the end of here, I put 2 colon 1. 2 colon 1 is a way to represent 2 to 1. The relationship is 2 to 1. Let me spell that out for you all. T-W-O, T-O-O-N-E. Two to one. That's what that represents. So two moles of ammonia relates to, proportionally to, one mole of ammonium sulfate. So the question was, yes, sir? It's a daily occurrence. Yes, you may. I could throw erasers at you, too. That'd work great. We have to pull the goggles back out. I forgot about the goggles. Oh, man. Christmas break makes me forget all the good stuff. I'm <laughs> Just so you know, while we wait for Mr. Dehydration. Um, <laughs> Mr. Dehydration. I passed out plastic lab goggles because certain students were sleeping. 
and I was afraid when I threw markers at them, I might hit somebody that was innocent. So I made everybody around them wear goggles so that they wouldn't get their eyes poked out when they threw the marker. So, anyway, we're back. Ammonium required to produce 12.2 moles of ammonium sulfate. See, the question is, if, if one, if given one, how much of the other? Okay. The two things in question here are ammonium sulfate and ammonia. And I need a relationship between ammonium sulfate and ammonia. That's why I did this. And I know that for every two moles of ammonia, that relates to every one mole of ammonium sulfate. So the question now says, if given that you produce 12.2 moles of ammonium sulfate, how much ammonia did that require? So go back to this idea that we have a given, something that's given to us, and the conversion factor that produces what we've been asked for, what's required of us. Right? If I were to write this on the board right now, I would say something like, I've been given grams of ammonium sulfate. Right? I've been given grams of ammonium sulfate, and I need to end with Actually, I'm given moles, moles of ammonium sulfate. And given moles of ammonium sulfate, I need to answer this to solve for moles of ammonia in H3, right? So what must my conversion factor be made up of? Moles of, okay, in the denominator, it needs to have the units moles of ammonium sulfate. And then in the numerator, it needs to be What's the numerator? Moles of ammonia. Right. So I need something that relates moles of ammonium sulfate to moles of ammonia. I get that from my balanced reaction equation. It relates in a manner of 2 to 1. My moles, the top, would be moles of ammonia. 2 moles of ammonia relates to, or is equated to, in the balanced reaction equation, 1 mole of ammonium sulfate. See that? So just by looking at this, what's the mass? Or what's the answer? Excuse me. 12.2 moles. If I have 12.2 moles of this, how many moles of ammonia did I need? 24.4. Two times my 12.2, or 24.4. Can you erase this? I'm sure we've got something similar on the slide. So 12 moles of ammonium sulfate times a two to one ratio of moles of ammonia to ammonium sulfate means that I needed 24.4, excuse me, 24.4 it should be, it's a typo, 24.4 moles of ammonia to begin with. Why? Because for every two that I have to start with, if it fully reacts, it produces one. So in order to produce 12.2, I needed to start with 24.4. Now, I'm going to show you a graphical way to do this. Kind of a, you know, if you're, used to be if you were either a, a Windows person or a Mac person, an Apple person. You either knew the code or you worked with symbols that represented a nice graphical user interface and all that kind of stuff. I know Windows has kind of gone to Apple kind of mentality, but this is going to be a graphical way for you to figure this out. Hopefully it'll help you. But what I'm about to show you is just another way of doing this same exact thing. So if coming up with a conversion factor and doing the math like that makes sense to you, we're basically going to be doing the same thing, but maybe a little bit different way of coming about what this conversion factor should be. So let's say, for example, this is the same question. Basically, I paraphrase the same question. Let's do the same thing again. Given 12.2s of ammonium sulfate from that same balanced reaction, what, how much ammonia do we need? We see that we're given ammonium sulfate, so we have the balanced reaction equation, ammonium sulfate and ammonia. What I do to start with is I draw a vertical line from the stoichiometric coefficients from whatever I've been asked. I'm asked to relate somehow ammonium sulfate and ammonia. So my process is I write the balanced reaction equation and ammonium sulfate is right here. I draw a vertical line 
and ammonia. I draw a vertical line. I put the vertical line at the stoichiometric coefficient. Okay, so I'm relating these two things, ammonia and ammonium sulfate, and then I connect the two with a, with a box. This process, hopefully it makes sense in a minute. Then what do I do? Well, I say, what is the proportionality between the two? It's a two to one. How do I know that? I take the stoichiometric coefficient here, I bring it down, two, two, one. See that? So I write two to one, or whatever it may be. This could be three to one, five to one, five to two, whatever it is in the formula. As long as it's a balanced direction equation, vertical lines write the stoichiometric coefficients in that section. The next part, I've been given 12.2 moles of ammonia sulfate. Ammonium sulfate. So I treat this as my moles relationship. And I write down whatever I've been given. I've been given 12.2 moles of ammonium sulfate. So I go to ammonium sulfate, I bring it down, and I write what I've been given. And then I write a question mark for what I've been asked. So I know that they relate two to one, and I've been given this much. I've been asked this much. So what I do is I draw an arrow on my box, the, this bottom line. I draw an arrow towards what I've been asked. I've been given moles of ammonium sulfate. I've been asked for moles of ammonia. I've been asked for this. Now the question is, I need to take this number and multiply it by a conversion factor of some kind. And that conversion factor is going to come from these two numbers. So what are probably my options right now? Converting between from here to here, it's either going to be times two, two over one, or it's going to be times a half, one over two, right? That's my conversion factor is going to be one of those two things. Which one is it? Well, what I do visually is here's how I think about it. As I move in this direction from here to here, the first number I would bump into would be the one. And when I when I hit that number, I drive it down. So what happens is. Visualize it this way. As I move from this, I hit the 1, and I drive it underneath the 2. So what's my conversion factor? 2. It's 2 over 1. <clears throat> Moving it from, the, since I'm given this and I drive towards my unknown, I hit my known, which is 1, and it drives it underneath the other one. And that produces my conversion factor. So what I need to do then is take this times my conversion factor to produce this. Start with the balanced reaction equation, follow that process, and you will get it right every time. Okay? But that's just a visual way of doing what I did on the other one, of taking my given, multiply it by a conversion factor, which is made up of, write down the units, look at the equation, and figure out what should be where, and then do the math. This is just a visual way of doing exactly the same thing. Now, I encourage you to practice using this process, because there are going to be times when we start with a mass let's say. This is later on in the module. We start with a certain mass. Rather than saying, I have two moles of ammonium, in this case of ammonia, if I have two moles of ammonia, then I might say I have 137 grams of ammonia. Well, you're going to have to convert the grams to moles. Using atomic Using atomic mass. Right, you're going to be given the mass of, an L, of a molecule, divided by the atomic mass to figure out how many moles you have. But save this line for moles, because stoichiometry relates moles to moles. So on this line right here, only put mole amounts. And if you have one mole amount and you have a conversion factor, you can compute the other. So if we were going the other way on this, and I was told I had 24.4 moles, and I was going in this direction, what would my conversion factor become? The two would be driven under the one, so this times one half, which produces 12.2 moles. See, it's going to give you the same answer if done correctly in the opposite direction. Why? It's a state, it's a true statement of equality. It works in both directions. 24.4 times a half equals 12.2. 12.2 times two equals 24.4. It goes back and forth. So the question on your own 8.1. My intention was for you to do this with the time, but because of technical issues in the board meeting, I was late, so I went ahead and walked through this. That wasn't my intent. But let's go ahead and do that. 8.1, the question is, 
A chemist performs the following reaction to make sodium nitrate. Two, it's in your book. How many moles of oxygen must the chemist use to produce 45 moles of sodium nitrate? So, there is your reaction equation. Is it balanced? Let's see. Two sodiums, two sodiums, two nitrogens, two nitrogens, four oxygens plus two oxygens is six oxygens, six oxygens is balanced. Okay, now we know I can use these coefficients, right? I've been asked for how many moles of oxygen, right here, to produce 45 moles of sodium nitrate right there. Go ahead and draw my vertical lines underneath to put the stoichiometric coefficients so of the two things I'm looking at, oxygen and sodium nitrate. What do I do next? Where is the relationship? It's one to two. It comes from stoichiometric coefficient of one and of two. A little bit out of order, but I've been given that I produce 45 moles of sodium nitrate, and I've been asked moles of oxygen, right? So I'm moving in that direction. My answer is going to be 45 times what? What's, does everybody see that my, my, my conversion factor here, my multiple, is going to be one half? Because visually, as I move from 45 to the question mark, I'm going to hit the two first and drive it under. So it's going to be times one half. And times one half produces an answer of 22.5 moles of oxygen. Okay. That's 8.1. Mm -hmm. So again, today we'll hopefully learn a process. Take a reaction, write the reaction, balance the reaction, identify the two molecules in question, Draw a vertical line below the stoichiometric coefficients, and then connect them. Write down your relationship between the stoichiometric coefficients. Write down the given, and a question mark for the unknown. Compute the conversion factor by visually moving from the given to the unknown, and as you hit the first number, drive it under and form a fraction. Multiply the given by the multiple to answer for the unknown. Are there any questions on the process? Yes, sir. What's the, the second part of that? It's how many moles of other... Right? Okay, so the question is how many moles of... Right here, the sodium nitrate? Yeah. How many moles? What is the... Real quick, this is the easy, one of the easiest kind of questions that there is. You don't have to draw anything for this. What is the relationship between this molecule and this molecule? It's two to two. It's two to two, which becomes one to one, which means they're the same. How many moles are needed? 45.0. How do you know? It's a one-to-one -one relationship. For every one of these, any one of these, therefore I need the same number of those. Okay, so you can see if we had a reaction over here that had seven, eight, or nine reactants and five, six, seven, eight, or nine products, and we knew one of them, we can now compute, let's say there's nine produces three, okay? We're talking about 12 different molecules. If I know one of them, I can calculate what's needed for me all other 11 of them, if I have a balanced reaction equation. It's power stoichiometry. So if I come to you, and you're a purchasing agent, and we're in a company, and we're making this stuff, and I tell you how much we need to make, you can figure out how much you need to buy. Why? Because it's always going to produce in a two to one produces two relationship. Every time. As long as, and not, it will do that every time. What we get into next is called the limiting reactant. What happens if you have this stuff in a system and they're reacting and you run out of something. What happens to the reaction engine? If you run out of reactant, the reaction engine stops. Okay. So the question might be, given this much of this and this much of this, how much is produced here? It's going to be limited by whatever runs out first. And we're going to figure out what that's going to be.